the chat box to send messages. And any messages will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in the toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. I will be presenting questions to the speakers at the end of the presentation. If you're just joining us, here's a reminder that this session will be recorded and shared with all participants. And even though this is our final presentation, the 2023 Carbon Conference isn't over just yet. We'll be meeting tomorrow to continue the conversation in person from 4 to 7 p.m. at Two Beers Brewing Company's The Woods Tasting Room. This is located in Seattle's Industrial District, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Finally, please keep an eye out for our post-conference survey. We want the content that we share to be applicable to each of you and the work you do. We value your feedback and try to incorporate audience input as we create the agenda each year. So please let us know what was great, what was missing, and what you're excited for at our next conference. Our next session is focused on embodied carbon, a term we've heard a lot today. Embodied carbon is the greenhouse gas emissions arising from the manufacturing, transportation, installation, maintenance, and disposal of building materials. The building sector is responsible for an estimated 30% of all global emissions, with a significant portion of those resulting from construction materials. Quantifying and reducing the emissions associated with building materials like concrete, wood, and steel is a necessary component of addressing climate change. As with all greenhouse gas emissions, reducing embodied carbon is not only an environmental issue, but also a climate justice and equity issue for frontline communities that bear the impact of manufacturing and climate change. Significant efforts are underway to improve data and transparency related to embodied carbon and life cycle analysis. For wood products, this includes disclosure of the source forest where wood products originate and the impacts of forest management practices. In the policy arena, several states have passed by clean laws that require disclosure of embodied carbon of building materials. Here in Washington state, the legislature has been discussing a similar measure for the last several years. And as we've heard today, efforts are underway across the wood supply chain to enhance transparency and sourcing of climate smart wood. Our next presenters are making an important contribution to this topic with a new research partnership focused on reducing embodied carbon in building materials. Experts from U.S. Green Building Council and RMI will draw from their new report to synthesize the state of embodied carbon emissions and strategies for embodied carbon reductions in building materials, particularly wood products. Please allow me to introduce each of our presenters. First, we have Wes Sullins, who leads materials and resources activities at the U.S. Green Building Council, which is a global nonprofit organization that administers the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, or LEAD, rating system. Wes is responsible for the materials credits in the LEED rating system and guides leadership criteria related to construction waste, product manufacturing, material transparency, circular economy, and embodied carbon. He, was work he has, has worked in the public, private, and for nonprofit sectors for more than 20 years on broad topics, including energy efficiency, building codes, supply chain sustainability, and chemicals transparency. Next, Aury Bukowski. Kauskas is a senior associate on the Realize California team, which focuses on catalyzing the development of a California-wide deep energy retrofit program. Aurie also engages with the broader Realize team, the Advanced Building Construction or ABC Collaborative, and others within RMI on advancing building decarbonization. And with that, I'll hand it over to them. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to actually start, and then Aurie will come on after I do some slides. Let me make sure that's going to work. Okay, should be seeing my slide deck. Um, well, thank you for having us here. Um, as you mentioned, I work at US Green Building Council, and um, we've been, you know, we administer the lead rating system and have been working on forestry and wood issues for many, many years. Actually, I'm going to go to my first slide here evolution of lead. And what we do is we maintain a rating system along with other things we do at the organization um, that rewards best practices in green building. And it's a crucial time right now because we're in the middle of writing lead version five, the next version of our rating system. Uh, we just released a draft of the O&M rating system and the new construction, O&M being operations and maintenance kind of existing buildings. The new construction rating system will come out early next year for public comment. And that's the time that we hope all of you will take a look and, and help us make the best rating system we can. But it's been more than 10 years since a large update, and a lot has happened at that time, specifically around embodied carbon and the decarbonization of buildings in general. So we have some really big goals for LEED version 5. You see them on screen here. There's kind of a three-part stool that we're trying to, to tackle, climate action being the big kind of anchoring uh, priority for LEED version 5, 
as well as conservation restoration of the ecology and quality of life, the health of people and planet. So V5 has a lot of goals. And to that end, we want we wanted to, to kind of look at the state of the industry in terms of decarbonization. And Lead Version 5 wants to make a big statement on this by having uh, lots and lots of great strategies that have happened around decarbonizing buildings, both from the operational side. You know, we're now at a point where we can envision and actually start to design and show in some of the case studies we just saw you know, zero energy buildings or even positive buildings in terms of operational energy. And we're, at the same time, we're starting to understand the implications of embodied carbon, uh, but we're not quite as far along that learning curve. So we need to speed up action. But LEAD V5 plans to go big on all of those types of decarbonization, including things like refrigerants as well, and transportation emissions of how people get to buildings, all of those things. So it's a big theme for the rating system. But why embodied carbon? You know, this question sometimes comes up, um, I think less so this year in the last couple of years than before, but we wanted to answer this question and that's why we entered this partnership with RMI. And that learning curve I was talking about, we are still in the early days. You know, we've we've started, started to, as an industry, understand some of the impacts of the materials and the way we build our buildings, not just how they're operated. But we're, and we've got some kind of initial sense of scale. We're at that starting to have some tools, some good ones like EC3 are out there taking advantage of all the data that's been created. Whole building LCA and things are out there as well. But we need to get to a place where carbon storing materials and good solid limits are in place to really drive down those carbon emissions. And we must accelerate that. Uh, now is the time to act. We don't have the same amount of time we had to kind of figure out the energy efficiency conundrum of, of the last 40 years and figure out zero energy buildings. We have to do this much faster. And with that, uh, USDBC wanted to partner with RMI and and figure out what's the state of the science and can we come up with some good actions and guidelines for speeding up the adoption of low carbon technologies and tools and, and materials for buildings. And this is a report we just released at our conference, which was in September. Um, it's called Driving Action on Body Carbon in Buildings. And you can get a link to it on that code right there on your screen. And so I just wanted to share a little bit of the report and kind of some of the background and the big findings. And then I'll ask Ari to come on and he can really dig us into the, the piece on, on forestry and carbon because that's his expertise area. Um, so I'm not going to run through the whole report, but just to get a, a flavor of it, it's meant to be very accessible. We're sort of asking these big picture questions like what is the opportunity for embodied carbon? There are still some folks out there that perhaps don't, don't have the answer to that or there's some conflicting data. What should we prioritize? Um, operational or embodied carbon? That sometimes comes up on design teams or with, with stakeholders. What can we do to reduce embodied carbon today? Do low carbon materials cost more? How can I measure things? Is the data good enough? We sometimes hear that quite a bit. Like there's a lot of data, but can you rely on it? Um, some questions around interiors and renovations. And then we drive into some of the big materials that have a lot of embodied carbon, concrete and steel, wood and carbon storing products. Then we have a little bit on the policy landscape and some case studies and examples. So hopefully it's a very useful resource that you can all take a look at and uh, get some, some in good information around embodied carbon. So I'm gonna go through just a few of the highlights. Uh, the other thing we did in this report is try to make lots of infographics and a very accessible um, data and things so that it's easy to pick up and you can kind of always read deeper and go, go into the, the, the resources and the links and the citations and all that, but you can also just pick it up and see these things at a quick glance. So the question of how big of an opportunity is it? We we go into the numbers. We you know found that about 11% of global emissions come from the materials, the the embodied carbon from materials globally, which is a big number. And but to put that in perspective, we try to have other metrics as well. And one of the things we we've done here is try to estimate. You know, not just maybe how many cars that on the road that is, or some of the traditional things you might hear about as as carbon um, equivalents. But what's the equivalent amount of wildfires that can be avoided just by reducing a small amount of emissions? Now, this is the CO2 from wildfires, not the other impacts. But the idea that if we reduce small amounts in embodied carbon, we can have large uh, impacts equivalent to very big climate events that we're experiencing like wildfires. The other questions uh, of, of what do we prioritize, operational or embodied? And sometimes this is seen as sort of a zero sum game, but of course it's not, we need to do both. 
and tackling both is essential. And I think this graphic tries to share, if you do one or the other, it's still a lot of emissions. So if you have a high embodied carbon building and you have low operational carbon, there's still a lot of emissions total. Whereas if you have a low embodied carbon, but a high operational budget, then it's still a lot of emissions. So the key is to do both. That's the, that's the solution. And how do we prioritize? What should we prioritize today? Something we wanted to have as a key takeaway is sort of a loading order or a uh, hierarchy of uh, best interventions. So there's a lot of things you can do if you've got a, a fresh start, you've got a new building or you've got an existing building on site to renovate. But what if you just have some materials and a renovation or a tenant improvement or something? Each one of these interactions and uh, have steps that they can do. So if you're at the beginning, you can reuse a building. That's of course the best thing you can do to keep that embodied carbon of all those materials in place and continue using that embodied carbon. If not, if you're starting to build new, how can you right size and dematerialize? Really get efficient on the, the size of the buildings, the, the use of those materials to drive down the amount needed. So that's kind of the reduce, as in like reduce, reuse, recycle. This is the reduce your building, make sure it's the right size. Then once you have to select new building materials, how can you find carbon storing materials? Those are those, those ones that can speed transition to zero embodied carbon, uh, and responsibly produce bio-based and concrete materials that can store carbon directly. We go quite into uh, quite a bit into the carbon storing products in the report, uh, so please look into that as well. If all you're doing is if you're at the construction phase or whatnot, and you you have less opportunity to influence the full design, then there's lots that can be done to substitute products. Like find if you're purchasing an insulation or whatever it might be, uh, there are options out there, and tools like EC3 can make it easy to find lower carbon alternatives. And then the finally, you, you know, we can't forget the sourcing. How are these things made? LEED is a rating system that's multi-attributes. So we look at things like carbon, but we also think about um, the way things are sourced and responsible harvesting and things like that. So that's another consideration that has to be taken in when we look at embodied carbon. And finally, if we've done all this great work to make low carbon, good, clean materials, et cetera, um, how do we make them circular so they can stay in use as long as possible? Another reason, uh, another another impact that LEED deals with is construction waste and recycling and things like that. And that has to be part of the decision in materials as well. And really um, the answer is, I think you just saw this on some of the case studies we just saw, it's a combination of all these interventions that result in deepest reductions. You know, it's not one or the other. There's no like silver bullet of just choose this material or just reuse something. It's really a combination of all these things that drive the carbon down as far as possible. Another question we were trying to address is, is the data good enough? You know, there's there's sometimes um, skeptics around, well, embodied carbon data, you know, the EPDs is not that accurate, or it's just looking at certain phases or whatnot. But we we tried to point out that in today's kind of scientific community and, and what we think about for buildings or even fuel miles in cars, there's we understand there's a bit of uh, margin of error when it comes to all these things, but we still know how to drive down emissions, and we still know some of the good practices. So for a car, I think that's the best analogy. You know, a car might have a fuel mileage sticker on it that says you get 30 miles per gallon or whatever, but your mileage is going to vary based on your terrain or how you drive. Um, and regardless of that, we know that a smaller build, a smaller car with lighter, um, lighter cars, good driving habits, things like that are the strategies that can make them more efficient. Same thing with embodied carbon of materials. We know there are certain strategies like reducing quantity, using reuse where you can, and selecting products with lower GWP, and looking at those impacts. Where are they coming from? Is it manufacturing efficiencies? Is it product efficiencies, delivery, things like that? Then we drive into, I want to share just a little bit on some of the products and materials before we jump into wood. What is the future of concrete and steel? And, you know, this is one of the materials that's often targeted when you look at embodied carbon, they seem to, you know, concrete and steel reductions are where most of the, the low hanging fruit are today, especially optimizing around your low, your, your low carbon concrete mixes. But what's interesting is that both of these industries, steel and concrete have these curves that they've created, very similar to this one you see on screen, um, where both industries are trying to get to carbon neutral by something like 2040, 2045, 2050 in that range. And they're both relying on some big technology advancements about 15 years out from now, 10 or 15 years 
you know, for concrete, that's looking at carbon storage technologies to really take on. For steel, it's looking at new ways to source that steel and using things like hydrogen instead of some of the high polluting energies to make the steel, refine it. Um, and so while that's great, we need to speed up that adoption because we really don't have a lot of time to wait for those technologies to come on. And so things, if there's any way that LEED or the work we're doing in the rating system can speed that up, speed up that adoption, uh, that's something we want to do in LEED version 5. And we have this nice chart in the report about promising technologies for lower carbon uh, materials for cement and steel, concrete and steel. And these just give an idea of some of the things that are out there um, right now that can make lower carbon building materials. So for lead version five for steel and concrete, we are looking at some, some I can't share too much detail because we're right in the middle of, of writing the rating system, but when it comes out next, uh, next quarter or, or quarter one of 2024, um, you'll you'll see things like requiring perhaps some low carbon alternatives and certain uh, materials like concrete and steel. We'll also be supporting the tr transition away from fossil fuel production by encouraging things like the next generation of steel manufacturing or um, more renewable sourcing for the, the fuel for those, those materials and innovative carbon storing technologies. So trying to speed up the adoption of some of those new technologies. Next, the question we asked in the report is, can wood products benefit the climate? And with this, I'm gonna turn it over and let Ari take a shot at trying to answer that question for us and highlighting what's in the report. Take it away. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, Wes. And just wanted to check if everyone can hear me all right. Yep, you sound good. Excellent. Um, yeah, well, thanks Thanks so much again. and. Yeah, really a pleasure to to be with you all today. Um, yeah, really looking forward to kind of diving into this question with you all. Um, and I'll preface that um, we're doing a, kind of a number of things on wood at RMI, and and my background is is largely in wood products. Um, but I was not one of the authors of this uh, report. I kind of played a supporting role here, so I'm uh, really happy to to take back any questions which I can't answer today. Back to the team um to see if they're able to help you um kind of get any specific um answer any specifics um but yeah broadly speaking um also really welcome any follow-ups after this conversation to continue chatting about wood um so i think starting off this section with this somewhat provocative question is appropriate um i think as many of you are aware um right now the discourse around wood products and forestry um, is sort of can be sort of hotly contested. We've got um, you know some some folks arguing on on the one hand that we've got you know a very clear case for woods having wood having a, a carbon benefit in construction, and we also see some skepticism and criticism um, on the other hand. Um, and I think that speaks to the fact that we as an industry um, can can all do better at kind of answering this question in greater detail and depth um, for all of the folks who really want to understand it better. Um, and I'll highlight four key takeaways uh, from, from this report, from our perspective when it comes to wood products. Um, so the first is that uh, EPDs are, are not enough, um, really when we're talking about the full environmental impacts, uh, both positive and potentially negative associated with wood products. Um, we advocate that biogenic carbon be reported separately. Um, and the reason for this is that we don't have enough uh, really evidence to support at this stage directly including that um, into the total embodied carbon of wood products and happy to chat a little bit more about that um, later. Um, a focus on sourcing is key. So some of the biggest gaps in the environmental data associated with wood products are in the forest. Um, and so we've really been encouraging um, specifiers to open up conversations with foresters, with landowners, the folks on the ground who really understand um, the situation, um, the dynamics that, and the diversity of local conditions which drive their decision-making in the forest. So that's, I think, really a key is that in this industry, we're, we're really advocating for uh, building those relationships so that that mutual understanding can grow. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, we know that our forests are under enormous uh, pressure from climate change, and that's going to continue and increase into the future. Um, and it will affect um, not just the forests and the wood products that we get from them, but other ecosystem services, which we rely on our forests to provide um, you know, watershed protection, wildlife habitat, um, and among many others. Um, and procurement of wood products um, specifically can be a very powerful revenue stream, which we could leverage to fund uh, sort of the next generation of climate responsive and climate smart forestry to preserve and uh, enhance our forests into the future um, in the face of climate change. So diving first into EPDs. Um, so the report highlights uh, some categories of either emissions or removals, um, which may or may not be captured within EPDs. Um, so it's key to point out here that some of these um, categories of sort of carbon flows associated with wood harvest and production are not captured in an EPD. Um, but more broadly, um, I think there are, it's, it's worth just reflecting on the concept of a system boundary in an LCA. Um, so those of you who are familiar with kind of the, the LCA process, we have to sort of draw the line somewhere. And one of the challenges um, in this process is that, you know, when we're trying to make comparisons between materials, uh, like mineral materials and wood, we have to be really thoughtful about um, how we're drawing those boundaries in a way which allows us to make apples to apples comparisons. Um, broadly speaking, we can and we should do better at capturing all of the upstream impacts, potentially positive, potentially negative, associated with um, wood products in order to get that full picture and make sure that um, specifiers are aware of those things and can leverage that in their design to achieve the best possible outcomes when using wood products. Um, until then, EPDs are a great but limited look um, at those impacts. Um, so biogenic carbon, um, the, we've got a graphic here in the paper really illustrating um, the concept that much of the carbon that's stored in living trees doesn't actually make it into our final wood products. Um, so that's kind of one consideration which is worth being aware of when we try to quantify biogenic carbon storage. Um, there are also other carbon flows associated with carb with wood products harvest. So soil carbon, um, root mass and slash effects, um, those contribute to the overall carbon flows of a wood product. Um, and a further complexity is uh, to add to this, this picture is the fact that those flows may occur over many years or decades. It takes you know decades for trees to regrow to commercial diameters um, in in the North American climate and for the species that we work with. Um, so that's something to take into consideration when we think about the, our calculations around biogenic carbon. So those are some complexities which. At the moment, we just haven't seen the consensus around how to treat that. And um, we certainly are my hope to and, and aspire to provide clarity on that soon with some potential upcoming work. Um, but for the time being, reporting biogenic carbon separately uh, is key. So a focus on sourcing. Um, so um, as, as Wes mentioned, um, LEAD v5 is an ongoing process. Um, However, the, these are kind of some of the priorities which fit into this category of looking closer at uh, wood product sourcing. So legal and sustainable sourcing certainly is a, a baseline um, kind of criterion as, as currently defined, disclosure of origin as well. Product specific EPDs is, is good practice. And really the, the kind of next frontier is this idea of climate responsive forestry. So kind of defining what that means, um, developing measurement and verification protocols for that, um, and then helping specifiers to understand how to design um, in response to that. Which kind of brings us home to this concept of climate smart forestry. Um, so the vision really is that if we get this right, um, that 
the act of harvesting um, and paying for the value of the wood products that we're getting from our forests um, can do any number of positive things for us in our in our forests. So we can potentially increase carbon forest stocks while we remove carbon from our buildings. We can support management uh, for the sake of increased biodiversity. Um, and we can look at the complete ecosystem in terms of all of the services that it provides to our communities. Um, so really understanding that and communicating that to specifiers is going to be key if we want to unlock the full potential benefits of wood products. Um, and just to illustrate kind of one quantitative example of those potential benefits, we've got a case study here which incorporated a number of really innovative measures um, to tackle both operational and embodied carbon. Um, but one of the aspirations of this project um, was to show that um, you know, near, near zero or even climate positive buildings are, um, are theoretically feasible. So we can move beyond uh, incrementalism and really do deep embodied carbon reductions. However, it's important to point out that if we, um, in this case, when biogenic carbon associated with timber is reported separately, we've still got a positive um, carbon impact that is an emission associated with this building. If we were able to set up the conditions on the forestry side, in the supply chain side, um, and in the applications in the buildings where we could confidently say that all of that uh, timber entering the building can be counted as you know, negative biogenic carbon, then conceivably we could be in a place where we could sort of confidently say that these are buildings that have a climate cooling effect. So they're, they're carbon negative. I don't think we're quite there yet as we've highlighted in the report, but just showing that uh, really that's that's the goal and um, that's something that we can and should aspire to and shoot for in our work. Um, so I think I'll, I'll wrap up there. And um, this is a, a, a QR code to the report if folks wanted to, to take a quick look at that now. Um, but in the meantime, I think we've got some time for questions and answers. So I'd love to connect with you all. Thank you, Wes and Ari, so much for that excellent case study and for really speaking to the complexity of the conversation around the role of wood products um, in addressing climate change and what climate smart forestry is. Um, it's great to hear about the report and the work that you've been doing to scale the learning curve um, and how that informs the upcoming LEAD version 5, both to address embodied carbon um, and to develop strategies around accelerating the decarbonization of buildings. Um, you've tackled some really incredibly challenging and very important questions and having that QR code is so helpful to be able to, um, to just have everybody have immediate access. So thank you so much for, for sharing that um, on the QR code. So we'll go ahead and hop over to some of the questions. Um, and uh, members of the audience, just keep them rolling in. Love to have lots of questions. Um, so we'll just start off with um, one of the questions you investigated was how quickly we can reduce embodied carbon. What do you see as the most significant barrier to the necessary transitions? And how is the timing different for the different material types? Mm. Yeah, boy, that's a good one. Um, significant barriers, I guess some of it is is being addressed right now. Like the EPA uh, has some grant money out to get more EPDs on the street. So more data, we need more data on certain product categories to uncover what is the carbon footprint and what's the potential there. Uh, and better tools, things like EC3 is great, but as we get more data and things refined, they need to keep updating and, and keep getting better thresholds and benchmarks. And then the other piece is I feel like we need a bit of a push. Like for those that are the leaders, they really need to get held up as an example and shined a light on so that others can see that and try to achieve it. I mean, the Microsoft campus we just saw was a good example of that. Like they're doing a lot of exemplary things and they should be held up as an example for others. Um, you know, local governments, regional governments, they can also take a leadership role and show what's possible here. And I know states like Oregon have already done some work to try to get more EPDs for concrete and such, for example. So getting the data, um, filling in some of the gaps for where materials that are high intensity, but we don't know exactly how much is one of the barriers. Ari, would you add anything to that? Um, yeah, thanks, Wes. Yeah, and it's a great question. I think I'll just briefly add, I think we're at a, I think we're close to a tipping point on embodied carbon. 
um, where a lot of these technologies are kind of cost neutral today, or maybe even if you incorporate an integrated design approach where you're you know, incorporating the savings on materials, they might be even cost negative. And we know from other parts of the energy and materials transition, you know, like EVs, batteries, renewables roll out that you get to a certain point in the cost curve and it kind of takes off on its own. So I just wanted to maybe inject some optimism there that I think we're, we're really close to a point where, um, where the, we're going to see a lot of transformation in this sector. Always great when there are opportunities for some optimism in these conversations. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and what's one of the things that you mentioned is the role of local and regional governments. I'm curious if you can speak a bit more to the states that have been pursuing things like by clean, by fair laws. Um, a lot of what you've been speaking to and studying for the support sounds like it's, it's largely focused on more the private sector, but what can the public sector do to also help accelerate that transition? Yeah, no, they're a huge player. I mean, lead from the very beginning was was picked up by the military, some of the first lead buildings. And so they're the ones who really got off the ground. Um, and I live in California. I should have said that maybe. Um, so I'm most familiar with like buy clean in California and some of those things. Uh, but I think the role of of setting good benchmarks and like rules around how you quantify. I mean, as we wrote, we, we talk about in the report for the wood, you know, how you measure it. It really depends on the quality of the data and also the consistency of your baselines and and your bound system boundaries. You were saying, Ari. Um, so the role of the government could be to really help uh, make sure those rules are in place, that things are apples to apples, not apples to orange, and cut through some of the noise. I mean, that's that's what our report was trying to do too. Is there's a lot of um, you know I'll say this. You can kind of use LCA. The the power of LCA is you can. You can really tell important stories about reducing carbon and things, but you can also tell almost any story you want if you get the right data and kind of manipulate it in the way you want. Now, that's a very skeptical view, but that just points to the need for some uh, some guidelines and consistency around how to quantify things so that it's truly actionable. And I think we're starting to see that with the EPA DOE action on Buy Clean Federally. They're putting out you know hundreds of millions of dollars for grants to make better EPDs, better PCRs. You get into the weeds of that. Um, and I think the states and locals can do the same and really shine by example, start uh, doing these strategies and showing the private sector that it's it's something that's achievable. Um, yeah, that's how I would answer that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, our next question is specifically for Aury and uh, comes from Aaron Everett. Can you give people a ballpark sense of the magnitude of emitting source forest carbon accounting versus the overall picture of the current EPD methodology, i.e. what percentage of the overall biogenic picture are we talking about? Yeah, great question, Aaron. Um, I, I'm afraid I, I'm going to have to really punt on that one. Um, it's Yeah, I think it's certainly the question that we'd all love to get a better sense on of. Um, I think... I'll, maybe I'll just say like, like a, a few to your point about I see there's a kind of a few questions which I'll try to all answer at once. Um, also one regarding what's kind of the next step in better quantifying this. Um, so maybe I'll just start by saying I think the challenge that we face or the challenges that we face in answering this question are that um, unlike mineral materials like concrete steel, um, forests are extremely diverse, as folks on this call know, um, you know, just within a given, you know, you walk a few meters to one side and the site conditions are different, um, not to mention species, et cetera. Um, and I think that's part of why it's challenging to answer this question in a, um, in a simple way, but I think that's also an it's, it's kind of a call to action for us. I think that we should embrace that diversity um, and see that as an opportunity to leverage local knowledge, local stakeholders and local expertise to ensure that we're doing the best in every specific scenario and not trying to deploy a one size fits all approach, both in what we're actually doing on the ground and how we quantify it. Um, so in terms of a next step, I, I think the it might actually be kind of relationship building. Um, so I think you know a lot of the folks on this call are, are experts in what's actually going on in forests and really what forests need. And I think a lot of other people who might be on the call are, are probably you know expert designers, expert builders, developers, 
who want to who want to do the right thing and leverage their dollars to to make forests you know work as best as they can for you know for our communities. Um, so I think building those links and starting those conversations as as complex as they might be at this stage, I think would I would suggest as as the next step for us is to embrace that diversity and complexity and to as we as we say in the report, talk to your forester. Excellent, thank you. Um, and we have another question coming from an anonymous listener or viewer participant um, who would be interested in hearing some more about your strategies for quantifying biogenic emissions from forest harvests. Yeah, I, I think I would include that in what I just said. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, what what are some of the things that on the kind of supply and manufacturer side, suppliers and manufacturers can do to promote and um, improve embodied carbon, carbon outcomes? Mm. Well, I think it, it kind of goes back to some of that question around, um, maybe Aaron's question around the what's the, the the scope of emissions that are omitted or whatnot from EPDs. I feel like just we need, and it's hard, right? It's hard to get some of this information, but that's the idea of more disclosure, greater transparency of the impacts. And that's why on, on our report, we go pretty hard on, we need better EPDs. Because the ones we have today are, are pretty generic. They might say an entire region or entire species of wood, here's the impact. Um, but really to understand the full carbon picture, we need to know, you know, some some level of knowledge about the location of where that wood's coming from and some level of knowledge around the energy it takes to mill and transform that wood into a material. And a lot of that's lacking from the EPDs, as well as the other things are you shared about, like the other land use impacts from forestry and such. So it's, it's almost like a de it depends question. Um, and I wonder if, you know, there's other leaders in this space, and I think the Pacific Northwest is firmly in the lead on getting more data and making that connection to the mills, to the foresters, back to the project and the distances and the energy intensity and all of that. I feel like that's the frontier, at least for now. I mean, we don't have all solutions, but that seems like a gap we want to fill in for the next few years. Um, all right, I don't know if you want to share any other examples of that happening or, or anything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing specific to add. And, and that question, I, I'm not sure I fully caught it. That was on manufacturers, on yeah, manufacturers, manufacturers and producers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I'd absolutely echo everything that you shared, Wes, and maybe just point folks as well to kind of the new startups which are tackling this problem of EPDs. It's I've, I've worked as an EPD consultant before in the wood product space, and it's. This is hard collecting that data. Um, it takes a lot of time. It's slow. It's you know inefficient, and, and there's a lot more folks who want EPDs than there are folks who can help them get them. Um, so, automation, digitization, maybe even AI um, is something which I think a lot of folks are in the are kind of trying to innovate around to try to reduce that friction and the, reduce the cost and reduce the time it takes to to get quality EPDs. Absolutely. Um, I have a question, Wes, about one of the, the pieces that you shared that was kind of comparing the, um, the role of carbon with the, like the, the direct example of potential wildfire reduction and carbon emissions from, from wildfire being reduced with some of these practices. Are there other types of examples um, that you could point to of kind of those, those tangible examples that people can really kind of grab onto to, to represent and recognize the the different representations of what carbon reductions can look like. Yeah, we have some in the report. And I think most importantly is to understand the where the numbers are coming from because there's so much, um, there's been a lot of pie charts. We've probably all seen like embodied carbon is this much and it's that much. And um, but we tried to really drill down to what is the most accurate number that's scientifically defensible. And um, we talk about how like I think it's the U.S. embodied carbon emissions are six percent of of U.S. emissions um, are embodied carbon, and that equates to the entire emissions of California. So that's another way to look at it. Like the embodied carbon of the U.S. emissions is equal to all of California's emissions. That's a pretty big and different way to think about it. I I thought I was shocked at it when we read that. Um, so I think getting that's one of the big things we we were pleased to partner with RMI on and get there research expertise is like how to cut through some of the, the noise out there 
and distill down the most important science into these takeaways. So that's what I'd lead to. Yeah. And I saw a question in the in the chat about what would lead consider a widely successful approach to driving down carbon and lead V5. Um, I think what would be great is if, you know, in a few years from now, we have such rapid uptake and everybody wants to take these credits. Um, you know, we're hoping to have more points available for embodied carbon than have been in lead in the past. And I hope we're at a point where in a few years from now, we're ready to say, okay, let's, let's ratchet up those requirements. The time has come. Let's, let's raise the floor. Um, so that the next version of lead, we can have some more stringent requirements, even, re you know, make it mandatory that there's a, some, some part of reduction. So I think it's all going to be the way lead works. It's a point-based system, right? And we really look at how many projects are achieving those points. And that's a measure of success, but also hearing from project teams and stakeholders like yourselves um, on what we're missing or what can be added and improved. That's, I think, how we can find success. So it's, it's achievement rates, but also what we're hearing from our stakeholders and our community. Um, one of the report's recommendations is to request information about source forests and forest management practices. What progress or uptake have you seen on that recommendation in particular? And are there specific examples that you could point to for companies moving in that direction? You know, we've started to see, maybe I'll start with this one. We've saw, seen a few kind of innovative projects that have started to do these practices. Uh, led by Sustainable Northwest and some others, and we're starting to see that request. I think the the most compelling part of it is it's a new communication between the project teams and the foresters. You know, it's not just do you have certified wood or not. It's it's looking at a relationship that goes beyond that. And so we're starting to see it, and we're starting to hear it on projects, and are learning from that, and hope to put it into lead version five. Thanks. Um, this one's more specifically on wood again. What is the most significant challenge of building with wood in terms of embodied carbon? And on the flip side, what is the most significant opportunity? Hmm. What do you think, Ari? <laughs> um, I'm going to try to, yeah. So it sounds like, so the challenge being with reducing embodied carbon in wood construction, I'm, I'm sort of inferring um I, I actually I think it would pretty much I think our answer probably would be what what we've kind of highlighted in the report, which is that um what you're seeing in the building is sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh the opportunities um associated with wood construction and environmental impacts. So um you know, we see a certain quantity of wood and we see kind of how it looks. We see the structural elements that incorporate in a building, but where where a lot of those impacts are really hitting the ground, as we've highlighted, are what's happening in the forest in the years or decades prior and how is it being harvested and what's the forest look like after the harvest and what's happening in the subsequent decades as it regrows. Um, so I would say like, certainly design efficiently, you know, use as little as, as you can. That's always a good idea um, in any construction material. Um, but, uh, and, and, and use it, you know, appropriately and leverage all of the unique benefits that wood offers. Um, but certainly um, let's, yeah, let's kind of focus and take advantage of all those opportunities upstream. And if I can add to that, the reason I think one of the main reasons in our report that we say report, you know, if, if you're doing an analysis and you get carbon sequestration numbers, biogenic carbon, report those separately for, for wood, is because we don't we're we're concerned of sending the wrong signal that using more wood would end up storing more carbon, right? And we want to be careful. We want to use that precious resource as efficiently and as effective as possible. So that's partly one of the controversies around claiming that what is a carbon sink, you know, in buildings is that it could lead to more use where it may be inefficient or something like that. So that's one of the reasons why we say exactly that, to, to report those impacts separately until we have, you know, the best data we can. Just like a very, very important um, part of the puzzle to keep in mind. Um, I think we're wrapping up into our closing question. Do you have any specific outcomes or messages that are kind of just the key message that you would like our audience to be taking away today? Man, that's good. Um, <laughs> please read our report. Let us know what you think of it. 
and um, hopefully what's in there is helpful for the work that you do. And, you know, I feel like this, I don't know, um, for the last decade or two, we've sort of been limited by what uh, the wood, sustainable wood type criteria have been. And I feel like because of the climate change focus and the focus on forests in general, we are at this new era of thinking about forests as a different thing. And I think it's exciting. And we should all, as Ari said, I think you said it well, like embrace that challenge and let's all step up to try to answer some of these questions so we can make the best choices we can about wood and about our green buildings. Anything else you'd add, Ari? Um, yeah, I think you summed it up really well, Wes. I'd say maybe if, if you're not a forester, go to the woods and talk to your forester. <laughs> And if you are a forester, spend some time out of the woods and talk to your local architects and engineers. I love that. Great advice, love it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both for an excellent presentation. Great question and answer session. Um, really look forward to digging deeper into the report and thank you for sharing some, some signs of optimism and hope in this, um, in this space. Looking forward to seeing how that shapes what EPDs look like going forward and seeing what lead version five looks like when it rolls out. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and hand back over to Rachel to close us out for the day. Thanks, Katie. Um, thanks so much to our panelists and presenters from across the day and the rest of the conference for taking time to share your expertise with us. We've had a great three weeks of thought provoking and illuminating presentations. In addition to our presenters, we wanna thank one last time our partners and sponsors, uh, EcoTrust, EFM Investments and Advisory, Pacific Forest Trust, the Salmon Northwest and Vibrant Planet Data Commons. Thank you so much. Um, the other big thank you is to acknowledge all of the hard work of many people that went into making this conference a reality. A huge thank you to my wonderful colleagues at Washington Conservation Action for making this conference happen, no small feat. Um, thanks to the forest team for organizing and facilitating, particularly Brian Pollock, who is our lead on coordinating the many aspects of the conference, as well as forest team members, Katie Fields, Rico Vin, and Ava Stone. A huge thanks to our development team for their partnership in orchestrating the event particularly Tina Montgomery and Haleli Zacker, and uh, thanks to members of our outstanding comms team for the great conference materials and outreach work, particularly Zachary Pullen, uh, Ida Amrul, and Mallory Price. Thanks to the other staff and partners who contributed in countless ways. Last but not least, uh, thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. We're so grateful you took the time out of your weeks uh, this November and hope the conversation continues offline, including at our in-person happy hour tomorrow night, uh, at the Woods Tasting Room from 4 to 7 p.m. That is the last time you have to hear about it. So we'll see you all soon, um, tomorrow or another time. And in the meantime, we hope you find ways to apply the new knowledge you learned during the conference to promote carbon-friendly forest management. Thank you very much for being here.